Okay, are there any questions on the sermon this morning or brief comments? Keep them brief so that I can repeat them uh, for the live stream. Andy. Who are the super apostles? So, so we, we don't, don't know, know who they are. Andy's, Andy's question, question is, is who, who are, are the super apostles? We don't know any of them by name, but uh, we see them, they crop up, they come up by name at the end of 2 Corinthians, but Paul's already speaking about them in chapter 2, referring to these peddlers of the gospel. And um, so you see in chapter 3, there's this uh, polemical thing going on between him and these false apostles. And he calls them, I think, in chapter 12, false apostles. I think in chapter 13, he calls them super apostles. We don't know much except what we can glean from these verses, but that they they must have been men. They probably came from Jerusalem with their letters of recommendation. And uh, it does appear that they are teaching a false gospel, or at least they're minimizing the unsavory parts of it. And uh, so Paul here is combating them. And so they would have probably taken issue with the fact that Christ was crucified. Um, but what we don't think is that, like in Galatians, Paul's argument is really with the Judaizers. So Judaizers are Christians who are saying that Jews and Gentiles need to still keep the laws of Moses. Those are the Judaizers. These don't seem to be Judaizers because in 2 Corinthians, Paul, and even in 1, he's not really talking about dietary laws. He's not talking about the type of things you see in Galatians where he's saying these things have been fulfilled. But it seems like these false apostles are just taking the idea that this is what's important, is the outward, the external, the showy. And really kind of, Paul's thing in Corinthians is more to do with sort of a, a, a sanitized Christianity through, through Greek philosophy. So his whole idea about wisdom. And they thought that the gospel was foolish. So Paul's deal in Corinthians is more to do with, with these people and the false apostles, super apostles would have been ones. They're taking the gospel and just straining it through Greek philosophy, through what the Greeks would have thought to be important. Paul's saying, no, you can't do that. So, good question. Uh, Les? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So Les's so comment, comment is, is that the old covenant, covenant was a planned was obsolescence. It was, it was planned at the beginning that it would not be continual. And uh, that's very true, you know, these feasts, these sacrifices. And we see this argument taken up differently in Hebrews, where Hebrews is saying, look, these sacrifices have to be repeated. And when one priest died, we needed another priest to be ordained. And this whole system, you know, it, there was no continuance in it. It was just simply the repetition of the same old, the same old. It was never giving redemption. It was never giving salvation. So there was a planned obsolescence, a planned terminus. And um, that's what the Jews had such a hard time. And, you know, just to appreciate the Jews, you know, circumcision had been going on for, I want to say, about uh, 1,500 years, you know. And then I think Moses is somewhere around 1,200 B.C. It just depends on the calendar that you're working with. I think David's at around 1,000 B.C. But the, these traditions, I mean... Try to put this into perspective in some way. Suppose the United States has been a country for a thousand years. And then we say, all right, guys, 4th of July is done. No more 4th of July. No more fireworks. No more fireworks? Like, who doesn't love the fireworks? No, we're going to just, you know, ham and potatoes at the, you know, something totally mundane. Peas and carrots at the dinner table. No, I want the fireworks. And God would say, no, the fireworks is, is over. I mean, Sinai, there's fireworks there. <laughs> Grand finale, like no one ever saw. So you're right, it was a planned, planned, determined, a terminus. And, uh, but anyways, to my point, that was, that was hard for the Jews. Uh, I mean, that's what got Stephen martyred. Stephen was starting to, the first martyr was starting to teach, okay, Moses is passe, right? The law, the law in its the moral law still continues. God's truth still prevails. 
but the administration, that's the word I'm looking for, the administration has switched gears, you know. We've gone from horse-pulled buggy to Ferrari, you know. It's, you know, now we're in a Ferrari, so that's where we're at. That's the new covenant. Matt. Some people want to answer in the teaching service next, but uh, when we look at the, the Lord's Day 23 that we recited, might be a difference in how our modern language is too. The last sentence, all I need to do is accept this gift of God, it makes me think of more the Arminian mindset. But it, is it safe to say that what the Heidelberg is talking about here is we need, if you repent and believe, not I'm giving God permission to come into my heart? Right. I think what's important to realize in the catechism, we're talking about justification. So faith is a condition for justification, but it's not a condition for election. So there's an important, and, and actually we're going to look at that in the teaching service as we look at election, that you know, no, one, no one is justified unless they repent and believe. So there is an acceptance of this gift. But you're right, I usually, because to, again, you're right about words that, Traditionally today, people say, all you have to do is accept Jesus into your heart. Well, the Bible doesn't use that language. It's repent and believe. And uh, it, it could have been maybe not knowing the future, the Heidelberg could have been written, all I need to do is repent and believe in the gospel, and I receive this gift. You know, that would have been maybe a more careful. Confessions are not inspired with God, so we can say they could have been written different or better. So thanks, Matt. Clarence. So who brings on that repentance and belief? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. God himself. Yeah. 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 The, Holy the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Clarence's, Clarence's question is, who brings on repentance and belief? And so, again, as we look at Old Covenant and New Covenant, we talk about what is peculiar to each. We speak about them by way of contrast. So, in the Old Covenant, there were believers. God always had his elect. Um, and, and none of them, Moses, David, none of them, believed without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them a new regeneration. Regeneration, I mean, see, Jesus talks to Nicodemus about regeneration and says, how is it that you don't know about this? This has been talked about throughout the whole Old Testament. So the Holy Spirit is the author of regeneration. But if we just stand back and look at the forest for the trees, the Old Covenant is a covenant of law that says uh, it's written in stone, it's cold, it's unfeeling, and it's stipulating perfect righteousness upon penalty of death. And the new covenant says, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Spirit blows across this world like Jesus says, like the wind, converting people through the gospel. One of the contrasts we need to keep in mind is that old covenant is promise, new covenant is fulfillment. And so the old covenant looked wistfully to the new covenant and it anticipated it. It had to end. The law is saying, Christ, the righteousness of God, is coming. The Holy Spirit giving new life. The law says, be holy, and the believer says, I can't be holy. The Old Covenant says, be holy or you die, and you're like, I know that. And the Old Covenant says, Christ will make you holy. Christ will give you his righteousness. Christ will give you his spirit. So, yes, they could be saved. There were a lot of people saved in the Old Covenant. God said to Elijah, he always had a remnant. 7,000 haven't bowed the knee to Baal, but it all look forward to this new covenant where everything that was promised is now fulfilled. And so, um, so what's important to realize is we think about continuity and discontinuity. Old covenant, new covenant. Continuity is the same Lord, the same mediator, the same gospel, the same people of God, the same way of salvation. They weren't saved by obedience. They weren't saved by their works. They were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, just as we are in the new covenant. But when we speak about these two administrations, how did the administrations work? One worked through law. This one works through gospel. Now, there's gospel there. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's gospel. Every sacrifice that was made on the altar was gospel. There was gospel through and through and through the Old Covenant. Every sacrifice preached Christ to them. But what you see in the New Covenant is all of that is stripped off, and you just see, you see reality, the thing itself. You don't see many sacrifices, but you see the sacrifice. You see the Lamb of God. And so, 
But I think what a lot of Christians today struggle with is they just see all of that has been peeled away, all the, the symbols, the types, the shadows, the feasts, the ceremonies, the architecture, the furniture, the vestments, it's all been stripped away. And we're left thinking like, oh, all we get is Christ. And Paul's like, yes, all we get is Christ. He's come and so glorious. Um, but I do, occasionally I hear of Christians, I'll, I'll get Rick one second. I do hear of Christians who, who want to celebrate Passover in their homes. When I hear that, I blow a fuse. It, it, it scares me, it disturbs me, it's, it's anti-Christ. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, I think he says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. We don't go back to those things. I used this analogy recently. You know, all the shadows, the types, the, the ark, the incense, the veil, all of that, all of that were symbols, shadows, preaching the reality. And so it's like this. Suppose your husband goes off to war and you have his picture by the dining room table. And you speak with your kids, you know, when daddy comes home and you look at the picture and you remember him. There's a picture of dad. And that means something to you. And then he walks into the bed and he walks into the house. And you're still like, oh, I can't wait. And he's like, I'm here. And you're still looking at the picture. You're like, he's going to tear that picture up. And that's what's going on. Old covenant, we got all the pictures on the wall. Passover, dietary laws, we have the whole thing. When Christ comes, Christ says, tear up those pictures. I'm here. You see, the difference is, is it requires faith of a different order, if you will, in the new covenant than in the old. In the old, because they were babies, that's what God calls them. God says, I gave you training wheels. I gave you things to see because you were babies. But now in the new covenant, you're adults. So I've taken away the things to see. And so what does Jesus say at the end of John? John chapter 20. Um, John chapter 20. Thomas put out the ultimatum. I'm not going to believe that he rose unless I see it with my eyes. And John chapter 20, Thomas sees Jesus. He says in verse 28, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And we see Jesus commending faith. And we see in Romans chapter 10, Paul says, how will they believe unless they hear? And how will they hear unless the word is preached? I'm paraphrasing. But Paul is saying here in the New Covenant, all the symbols are stripped down. And faith comes through hearing the word. So there's an there's a intensity of faith in the New Covenant. We don't have all the little crutches to hang on to. But we have the Spirit generating a faith in our hearts that says, you know what, I don't need that. I have Christ crucified and resurrected. And I'm alive and I'm righteous. Him. Now God is kind, and he knows that we're corporal. Corporal means fleshly. We knew we're still babes in certain respects. And so he's given us two things to see and touch. He's given us baptism and the Lord's Supper. He said, let these be the supports for your faith. Baptism, see it. And Lord's Supper, you can taste it. You feel it. So... The Lord is still good. Um, Rick. All this I, I wrapped up. It's almost a sermon on 2 Corinthians 4. You know, 4, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the passing power belongs to God and not to us. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, planned, obsolescent, the continuity, you know, three times that for something that's coming to an end. You know, we talked about right. in chapter 3. It's it belongs to God, and so our faith belongs to God. It's not something that has limits. It's not something that is here that we can hide ourselves. Right. It's it's in us. 
us. Yeah. Yeah. He has written on our hearts. Yeah. Yeah. The power of the Holy Spirit. Right. right. You know, yeah. uh, w just to piggyback on what Rick is saying, is that, that God has planned it in this new covenant, sort of the internalization of the truth, of the spirit, of the regenerating power. These things come out now in a greater and fuller measure. Um, forget where I was going with that. We see, we see the glory, this is where I was going with that, is in the old covenant, the glory was in the external, the brandishing of swords and shields, the massing of troops, David's kingdom, Solomon's wisdom, the wealth, the ivory, the, you know, the lions. And, and in the new covenant, it also, to piggyback on Rick, the glory is, is seen in the transformed life, which is where Paul's going to get in verse 18. The glory is seen in this. It is power in weakness. You know, it is strength in weakness. That's why Paul is dancing as he's walking in this triumphal procession to his martyrdom. Is because Christ Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and he was born again. And so, again, the world looks at the church and says, you guys are just radicals, fundamentalists, whatever. And they have their names. They don't realize that the power of Almighty God is coursing through our veins. That we at this moment are every bit as righteous as the Lord himself. So they don't, you know, new covenant glory. We need to be reminded of, of who we are and whose we are. Just, it's, it's incredible. And election, election gets in there. Um, one other quick little comment. So Ken had to bust out of here, but Ken asked the question, when was that moment where the old covenant was sort of set aside and the new covenant came into its own? Was there a specific moment where we see that occurring? And it's a good question, and I don't know that I have maybe the best answer. But So he was thinking it happened at resurrection, and I think resurrection is sort of the final moment, if you will. But I look at it more like the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. It, it's gradual. And you can see how as the old covenant com is coming to its conclusion, it's like the sun is setting. So we see the 400 years of silence. We see uh, John was just sharing with us. He's reading through Samuel. And you read through the history of Israel. And it's just like you just want to say as a spectator, this isn't working out for you, is it? Most of the kings are unbelievers. It's just a mess. Idolatry, bowing down, it, this, this is just not working, is it? It's not making you righteous. Deported to Assyria, deported to Babylon, they come back, shabby little temple, nothing like Solomon's temple. It's not cutting it. The sun is setting, and it's about to go up below the horizon. And what we have then after those years of silence, you have one last ray of light shooting across the horizon as John the Baptist comes on the scene. And he says, there's a greater light shining. The light of the world is coming. And in the incarnation, we see the heavens split open. And we see all the angels pour out of the courts of heaven. They fill the sky. And what do they say? Glory. Doxa. Doxe. This is the Greek. Doxe. Glory to God in the highest. And so we see that sun rising. Jesus begins his earthly ministry, and he, he starts healing people, casting out demons. We see him feeding hungry people. We see him administering truth and mercy and justice to those who are oppressed. We see that sun rising, rising with healing in its wings, Malachi. And then we have crucifixion, sort of putting the final nail in the coffin of the old covenant, because what happens the moment he breathes his last breath? Anybody remember? Something very important. The veil. So God is just, God just goes, old covenant is done. Anybody can walk right into the most holy place and will not be killed. He paid the wages of our sin. Promise fulfillment. He paid the wages with his blood, he died the death we deserved. The law condemned him instead of us. The, the ministry of death 
executed all its power on him. The ministry of condemnation unleashed all its condemnation on him, and he rose the third day. And resurrection, you know, when that tombstone's rolled away and they see that it's empty inside, it's just like the sun is now at high noon. And we are in this new covenant forever. No new arrangement. No other covenant. And it really is. This is it. I always picture the curtain to carry as the A or the most significant event because it was a very clear picture to the Jews that things have changed and it was not done by man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Les's yeah. point is just that that tearing of the temple curtain was like the climactic moment, the, the unmistakable evidence that the Lord had done something conclusive and definite. Um, yeah, for one, the priest couldn't tear it. Um, it was very thick. It was woven. It was torn from top to bottom. Uh, they wouldn't go near it for sake of fear of being killed. And um, the pr- evidence right there that the Lord is saying, this is done. This is done. Clarence. But the main comment about Moses yes. Yes. and the veil of his face. Now, there's a reason and purpose for that. You all understand that. that uh, because of the brightness of his face. I was reading the Bible here many times. But the, uh, there is a light, okay? Uh, the reason the veil was over the face is uh, that their, their minds weren't made dull. For to this, Day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in the Christ it is taken away. Now, sometimes I believe our churches today still have that veil over their face, <clears throat> and they still want to get into the old covenant. You know, and I, I don't understand that. You know, it has to come into the heart, and no other way to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yes, and Lord willing, we'll go to those verses next week. The way, in what way is the veil still over the faces of the Jews today? But uh, Clarence's point is that uh, the Holy Spirit must be working inside of us. And I guess part, part, of, part of your point is that a lot of churches today maybe focus on just the external demonstration. You know, Paul will criticize the Jews who have the form of godliness, but deny its power. I think that's partly what we're looking at, too, is that partly the way, too, we shepherd our children is we want, you know, this is a work of the Lord, but we want to be useful tools in appealing to their hearts, um, working within them, you know, that this register within. So it's a good comment. All right, let's see if we can finish off the doctrine of election. The kids will come up in about 10 minutes. Uh, Please turn in the back of your Psalter hymnal to page 860. 860, the doctrine of election. Article 16, we believe that all Adam's descendants, having thus fallen into perdition and ruin by the sin of the first man, God showed himself to be as he is, merciful and just. He is merciful in withdrawing and saving from this perdition those whom he in his eternal and unchangeable counsel, has elected and chosen in Jesus Christ our Lord by his pure goodness, without any consideration of their works. He is just in leaving the others in their ruin and fall into which they plunge themselves. So Article 16 looks at the doctrine that God has chosen before the foundation of the world those whom he was going to save, and he had chosen not to choose others. So we were looking at that. Let's look at the Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. And we've been camping on verse 4 especially, uh, but we will also be looking at some other verses as well, verse 5 in particular this morning. I'm just going to read the first few verses here at verse 3, Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ 
according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. We'll end reading the Bible there, but we'll look at other verses yet as we continue. So if you have your bulletins, you'll see what we have done thus far, that election is a sovereign choosing. He chose us. We didn't choose him. God is the subject. We are the object. He chose us according to his will. And uh, so we look at that, John 15, I chose you. It's God's choice. Uh, we saw that election is a merciful and a gracious choosing, that God chooses us out of a mass of humanity that has fallen into sin. And so God is gracious. He doesn't have to choose anyone, but that the fact that he chooses some is an evidence of his grace. We'll come back to a few of these if we have time. It's a merciful and a gracious choosing. He chose us, us sinners, us, as Paul will say in Ephesians chapter 2, who were dead in our sins and our trespasses, he chose us. We saw, number three, that it is a selective choosing. He chose us. It doesn't say he chose everyone. He chose us. Jesus said in Matthew 22, many are called, but few are chosen. So it's a selective. He doesn't choose the whole kit and caboodle. He chooses some. He chooses a remnant. That's the biblical word. It's a selective choosing. It is a choosing in Christ. Again, just to refresh your mind, he chose us in him, in Christ. He has blessed us, verse 6, in the beloved. Um, so we saw here, here's a few blanks if you're filling in the blanks. Jesus Christ is the chosen one of God. We get that from Isaiah 42, for example. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. It's what the Pharisees taunted him with while he hung on the cross. They scoffed at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. So Christ is the elect, the chosen child of God, his chosen son. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And in and with him, God has chosen others. So it is in Christ that we are chosen. It is in union with Christ that we have been chosen. There's the blank there. You may have already filled, them, filled it in. He chose us in him. Some of these words, if you're looking at the words, will be used uh, more than once. And so we see that here um, our choosing is, is in union with Christ, along with Jesus. We're with him. All right. This is where we pick up something new. Election is a corporate choosing. He chose us in him. So we might gloss over this without realizing it. It's a selective choosing and in Christ choosing. Uh, it's a grace that he chose us, but it doesn't say he chose me. It doesn't say he chose everyone. Neither does it say he chose me. It says he chose us. So it's a corporate, communal choosing. To whom is Paul writing? Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. To the saints. He's writing to the church, not to the world. To the church in Ephesus. He chose you, plural. Second person, plural, pronoun. Us. He, you are, verse, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen race. See the corporateness? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people. The very biblical terminology when God calls Israel at Mount Sinai, a people. The church is a people. It's a citizenry. It's a nation. It's a race. We are a race, not distinguished by color, but distinguished by the blood of Jesus. 
that has covered us. And so um, each individual is elected personally, individually, yes, that's true. But the scripture does not view election separately, but it views election as a single organism, the elect church, the elect exiles, the elect of God, the saints. So there's a corporate solidarity between the elect and Christ, who is the elect one. So the Heidelberg Catechism will give a definition of the Apostles' Creed when it says that we believe the Holy Catholic Church. That's not the Roman Catholic Church. And this is the definition of what it means there to believe the Holy Catholic Church, that the Son of God, quotes, gathers, protects, and preserves for himself a community chosen for eternal life and united in true faith. What is the church? A community chosen for eternal life. You know, so we had a membership class, and Lord willing, we look forward to that next Sunday, new individuals, families joining the church. But uh, I've said to them, this is your family. And it's just a microcosm, isn't it, of, of the larger family. But Christ will say in John chapter 17, uh, or John chapter 10, he says, I have other sheep that are not yet of this fold, and I must bring them in. So think about glory one day. Like right now, we've got churches scattered here and there all over Twin Falls and the world. But one day, one body, one sea of people, one elect nation, one royal priesthood, one chosen race. It is a corporate choosing. Number six, it is an eternal and unchangeable choosing. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Election is anchored in eternity. The Belgic says it like this, it is made in his eternal and unchangeable counsel. So being made in eternity has nothing to do with us seeing what we might do or who we might be or become. God chose us according to his good pleasure. We looked at that last week in eternity. That speaks to you of, a, of, of a, how strong this commitment is. Kind of like think back in the olden days when King A and King B would be like treaties and they used to fight and they're like, okay, well, when we have... When our wives have babies, my son's going to marry your daughter. Predetermined. Predetermined union. Predetermined pact. And so son, daughter, marry. God says, before the beginning of time, I chose you. I chose you in and with Christ. We're going to be one family. All right, number seven. It is a holy and happy choosing. Ephesians 1 verse 5, look at this. He predestined, that's the other word for choosing. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to his, the purpose of his will. Let me see if I'm getting the right verse here. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. It's verse 4, that's why my eyes were messing me. Verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless. The goal of election is our holiness with the Holy One, blameless in the righteousness of the righteous one. Uh, Paul will say in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on a compassionate heart, kind, humble, meek, and patient. The choosing of God, choosing us out of this sea of, of wretchedness and damnation, and choosing us to be a bride, spotless, without wrinkle, holy, and happy. You see, um, you think of... Uh, Verse 6, verse 12, verse 14, it says, to the praise, to the praise of his glory, to be chosen for holiness gives us great joy. 
know when you're sinning? When everybody's fighting in the house, nobody's happy. But when we're holy, everybody's happy. Holiness always produces happiness. Does anybody ever stand before the judge after they've been caught stealing something? Say, well, you know, it was worth it. That's fun. You know what? This kind of stinks right now. Be facing 10 years in jail for robbing that bank. Holiness produces happiness to the praise of his glory. It is a special choosing. Um, Look at verse 8. That's where I got ahead of myself. Verse 5. It's verse 5 in Ephesians 1. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So think about this choosing. God chose us for himself. Isn't that remarkable? Election. He chose us in Christ. The Father picked his family. And he picked you. Remember I told you that story? It's a long story, so some of you never heard it before. I think it was my brother. Elizabeth might correct me later on, but I think it was my brother told the story of this two siblings that were arguing with each other. One was adopted. And the other kid says to his brother, yeah, well, you're adopted. You know how that was. You, know, you, mama, you know, he's like, you know what? Mom and dad couldn't help having you, but they chose me. You know, they chose me. And this choosing, God chose. He chose you and me. It is a special choosing. He didn't have to choose me. He could have chose my neighbor. Election is a doctrine that produces humility, gratitude, worship, gives security, peace, happiness. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Just think of that for one second as we conclude. But when you walk through those gates of heaven, I've had believers say, what am I going to say? And they're all worried. Like, what, you know, is this some last exam that I might fail? Uh, Peter's going to cast me out kind of a thing. You're going to walk through those gates. And I can't say for sure what you're going to do. But in the spirit of this text, you're going to say, Father, I'm home. Father, I'm here. It's good to be home. And already now the Spirit works in our hearts. And the Spirit gives us this prayer. Father, our dearest Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. So election, it's, it's the firehouse. It's the engine. It's the thing that drives the whole train of salvation. In conclusion, it is a God glorifying to the praise of his glory. All we can do is praise his name. All right, just if you want to fill in those two final blanks on number 10. The Arminian view makes faith a condition of election. The Reformed view makes faith a result of election. And then there's another quote from R.C. Sproul. Faith is a necessary condition for salvation, but not for election. So that takes into what Matt was asking about earlier. So brothers and sisters, we can only humbly and joyfully Thank God and praise him with joy to his glory. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. 
let's sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. Now, I chose that song because that's what election teaches us. If God chose us in Christ, He's going to hold His children. He's never going to let His children go. He will hold me fast. Let's stand and sing. Receive the Lord's blessing. We will sing in doxology, the doxology, the threefold. Amen. Lift up your hearts. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.